Let's do it. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. All the people that were working for Main Man were unusual. We were loud, ugly Americans, basically. Main Man, an interesting story, a very entertaining story, a very long, wonderful adventure. Hello, and welcome to episode 59 in our series exploring the history of Main Man, the management rights company which was renowned in the 70s for transforming the business of rock and roll. The philosophy of Main Man's founder, Tony DeFries, was to allow his artists full creative freedom by providing the financial support they needed to fulfil their artistic vision. The Main Man team pioneered outrageous and often controversial promotions and marketing techniques to generate media attention for their acts that set the benchmark for the decadence and indulgences that are now part of 70s rock folklore. A lot of it was going to restaurants, piling in and out of limos in various conditions. David and Angie had in their bedroom, where the bed was, a bit like a boxing ring, so you could have an audience sitting around the side and watch what was going on. So they were kind of just wild times, people floating in and out. Main Man worked with a diverse range of clients that included Amanda Lear, Mick Ronson, John Mellencamp, Mott the Hoople, Dana Gillespie, Mick Ralphs, Lou Reed, Marianne Faithful, David Bowie and Iggy Pop. David would come around in his gigantic lavender platform heels with a a new hair color every week and we'd all go off and drink uh, tea at Small's Cafe. In this episode, we're off to America for Ziggy's first tour. In early September of 72, at the end of the UK tour, Main Man had arranged for Ziggy's first US visit. So while David and Angie sailed on the QE2 to New York, the rest of the band flew over and began rehearsals in RCA Studios in New York. None of the piano players from the UK tour were free to make the trip, so the first task on arrival was to hold auditions to find a player to join the expanded band. Fortunately, in one of those amazing aligning of the stars moments, New York jazz player Mike Garson was invited by Mick Ronson and David to audition, and so began a remarkable musical collaboration that helped define the Ziggy era. At home in LA to recall how the Ziggy adventure began is the legend himself, Before we get to the actual audition, Mike, can you explain your musical background for us, your earliest musical influences? I had a very um, diverse, very eclectic amount of artists and and people I liked from Bach and Mozart and Beethoven and Chopin and Liszt as composers to concert pianists like uh, Arthur Rubinstein, Vladimir Horowitz, Richter, um, people like that. And then when you switched over to the jazz world, it was people like R. Tatum and Oscar Peterson and Bill Evans and McCoy Tyner and Coltrane and Miles Davis. And then when you switched to pop and rock, it was people like Dr. John and Leon Russell. So it was very, very divergent. I went anything that I liked, I liked. And it was that simple. There was one avant garde jazz piano player who I saw once live and I heard some of his records in mid 60s and that was Cecil Taylor and that would be the closest to the way the Aladdin Sane sound but Aladdin Sane is as crazy as it is is much more controlled uh, and it has melodies and hooks and humor and both tonal and atonal which Cecil was always pretty out there. So you're playing jazz clubs in New York City and doing some session work. So how did you get the invite to audition for the Ziggy Tour? First of all, it took me 20 years to find out how I got the Bowie gig. It was absolutely fascinating, Des. Um, There was this engineer who, he was recording the Annette Peacock album that I happened to play on with a rock group called Brethren with uh, Rick Murata was the drummer. And this engineer, I think his name was Bob Ring, I would see him on sessions, 1980, 85, 1987, and I'd always say, thank you for connecting me (laughs) to the Bowie gig. And he'd always thank me. And (laughs) one fine day, I found out it was actually Annette. And so I played on her album, David comes from England for his first American tour, which was the Ziggy's tour with Mick and Woody and Trevor. And he and Rano both 
were fans of Annette Peacock and that album and that particular song, I'm the One, which I actually recorded with Mick Ronson on his album a few years later, but I did the original version with Annette and I played a little out there on that album when she was out there and I played <laughs> pretty out there on her album and uh, David actually asked her to do the tour, but she had her own career going and her piano skills were a little limited, but she could have done the gig, but in a similar way to the way David played the piano. She said, no, I think the right call would be Mike Garson. And uh, that's when I got hired for eight weeks. And God knows how I ended up the longest standing member and doing 25 albums, 600 shows. I still haven't figured that out. I didn't even know who David Bowie was when I got the call. And Mick Ronson was a very special man, and he was as nice as he was great. And, and, and he embraced me because I was uncomfortable initially. They all watched the audition from the studio window, but he sat with me at the piano when I played Changes, and it was an eight-second audition, and, and then that was it. And he said, you got the gig? I said, Mick, I haven't even started to play. He said, I could tell I played the piano. So, I mean, that... When somebody trusts you, you're going to give the best you have. If they don't trust you, you're going to play like shit. At least I am as an artist. If you're just a studio-type musician, you're always good and you're white toast. But if you are an artist, if someone trusts you, you give 120%. If they don't trust you, in my case, I could be at minus 40. Because you're vulnerable and you're sensitive, you see? And it showed me some chords. I'm sitting at the piano here. He puts the chords up. I'm there right now on a piano and I go. He said, stop, that's it. You got the gig. Changed my life. This was the first time you'd met any rock musicians and any from the UK, especially anyone like Ziggy and the Spiders from Mars. What did you think when you first met them? My first thought is, am I in the fucking circus? You know, I walked into RCA and they were, it was the middle of the week I come to the audition and they are dressed like they're going on stage at Carnegie Hall. Each with their hair in a color that had to have been dyed and clothing like you've never seen and boots going up the ankle. And I'm thinking, I'm, I, I go down there and I'm in jeans and I'm thinking, where am I? But something told me this is going to be an interesting ride. From what I recall, I think Woody, before he even got that gig, was doing work as a plumber. So they were shocked and they were a little resistant because they were, you know, guys from Hull, right? They got into it. I got a kick out of it and I liked it because I knew okay, I'm in a show now, you know, so it was like, oh, this is Broadway or this is Vegas, but it's better music, but this is what he wants, I'll do it. But they they were resistant because it just wasn't part of their, their world. But they got into it, you know. In my mind, what happened is I was playing eight hours a day, then I go do a six-hour jazz gig, and a few days before I had the audition with Mick, I was in a jazz club, I made $5 and there were five people in the place. And these are people who were playing with Miles Davis and everything. And I'd come home to my wife. The rent in Brooklyn was $150. I made $5. So I said, if I do this every day, 30 days, I make $150. We still don't have telephone bills, car, gas, food. Something's fucked up about this. I think I'm going to go out with a rock band. And you got to watch what you wish for. And the next thing that happened is... Uh, David called. And then once I heard David sing, I knew I was dealing with a genius. I had actually, on that first Ziggy tour, slip out into the audience because I only played about 12 of the 20 songs because some didn't need piano. So when they didn't need me, I would slip out and watch him because those as you know, some of those gigs were not sold out. So I pop into one of the seats in the first or second row that was empty and look at this guy Probably the only time I saw him from the front because I was with the keyboard always behind him and I got to see him and he was new to this world as Ziggy and I thought this guy has 
what I call the it factor, IT. <laughs> and that was it. And you started rehearsing as soon as you got the gig, so you didn't have long to prepare. It was very quick. One of the most hilarious things that happened is I, I show up and I start playing and I look to my right of the, of the piano and I see what I thought was a sound system. I saw all these speakers and they went up pretty high and they're focused right at me and it was loud. And I'm just coming from jazz clubs with no amplification on shitty upright pianos and this is a grand piano and there's these speakers to my right. And I said very shyly, excuse me, I think the PA system is facing in the wrong direction. And it was my monitors. And I thought, oh, shit. And, he's, and they pointed up to the sky, and there was this PA system that was 10 times bigger than my monitors. And I said, oh, I've arrived in the rock world. This is going to be either something I hate or I love. And I ended up really enjoying it. <laughs> and I'm guessing that some of the small jazz clubs that you were playing in New York had no amps at the time or microphones, which is why all this technology was so new to you. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, even acoustic upright bass players, they were using gut strings on their bass and, and they didn't even have an amplifier. I work with Jimmy Garrison, who was Coltrane's drummer, and Elvin Jones. No microphones, and uh, Elvin was Coltrane's drummer, and the cymbals were very close to my ears, and, and it was painful and it hurt, but no amplification for the piano. But it was also gratifying because you could hear everything clear. It was just a little too loud. <laughs> and as this was the first time being on the road with a rock band, how did you find the other life that happens while on the road away from playing? I'm not too helpful in that area for you um, because it wasn't my thing. And I would sort of just go to my hotel after and work on the music. And I was already uh, married then and I had a daughter. So, so... I was living a different life and I wasn't really interested in that world. I wasn't rude when there were big parties yeah, after Carnegie Hall or Madison Square Garden or Wembley or whatever. I, I would certainly go, but it wasn't my thing. So I, was, I knew them all and they were all lovely in their own way and unique and Mick Rock too, you know, but I did not um, socialize at all. So I can't say that I, I knew them well, except I liked them and they were all very colorful. We've heard from several of the main man team in this series who were on the road with the band that sometimes, especially in the southern states, some of the locals didn't take too kindly to these weirdos arriving in their hometown. Absolutely. And of course, <laughs> I've experienced this on jazz gigs going to the south. You're not totally welcome there if you had long hair or whatever, no less looked like the band looked. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, we're going to be attacked here. You know, I better get out of here, you know. Not much different than these days, <laughs> but, but, but that's where we were. What can I tell you? The first gig was in Cleveland, and one of the most hilarious things about it is I had the music. I was just learning his music, and I had it on the piano, and they play an encore, and the encore is over, and, and I see the Spiders and David zoom out of the a back entrance, running, and I'm thinking, where are they running? And I'm putting my music together very slowly and organizing it for the next show. Which song comes first? When are we doing Ziggy? Blah, 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 blah. And I see a thousand people charging the stage. And I said, oh, fuck, I better get out of here. And I picked up my music and I start running. And I found them somewhere downstairs in a garage, you know, slipping out. And talking about a knot, uh, a, a gun, it wasn't a gun, but some kids had scissors and they were trying to cut off David's orange hair. Once you're on the road with the tour and you'd familiarised yourself with the music, what did you think of the tracks from the Ziggy album? I was pretty busy caught up in the tour, but I knew we struck gold. I, I knew that it wasn't going to be like uh, the White Album or something like that because it's just a little too out there, but it, I knew it was a great album and it was something to be proud of, you know. Although you all came from different musical backgrounds, it's fantastic that you all fitted in so well together. They didn't particularly read. Mick could read a little bit, but Trevor and Woody and David know. So it was kind of like, a, where is this guy coming from? He reads music and 
you know, it was, it, 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 I didn't belong. And somehow my playing was what David needed and wanted. And I was changing every arrangement every night. And it seemed to go along with David's brain and his creative process. And that's when I realized we're on the same wavelength artistically. Our lifestyles were 180 degrees opposite, but um, not creatively at all. And uh, that was very fulfilling to me. I was a little confused how we could have been so similar um, artistically, but very different as personalities. So the spiders all had their Ziggy outfits. What did they arrange for you to wear? I wish I could get a hold of the clothing. They took it all back after the tour, but they put me in a snazzy tuxedo with a, it was gray though, and I had a flower sort of by the lapel. Well, I figured it out quickly. I better get some of my own clothes also. So I go to this place in Hollywood. I think it was in Sunset Boulevard. And I walk in there. I said, I'm in the right place because there was Elton John buying something. So <laughs> I got these gigantic shoes that went up very high. They had, they were very trendy at the time. And then they set me up with this tuxedo, but it wasn't like a, a wedding tuxedo. It was like very modern with tails, but it wasn't like over the top the way they looked, but it was functional for me as a, as a piano player, right? After the first two warm-up gigs in Cleveland and Memphis, DeFries then booked the band to play Carnegie Hall in New York City. Not too many rock performers had played that famous venue before, and you were very aware of its illustrious history. How'd you find the gig? I always wanted to play in Carnegie Hall, and I wanted to play classical music there and jazz, and I didn't end up doing that for another five, ten years after David, but I did appear there the first time in a rock context, and, well, I could still say I played at Carnegie Hall. I just didn't say it was with David Bowie. It, it was almost the wrong venue. You know, It's it, you want to play acoustically there in a funny kind of a way. But, you know, we had good sound engineers and monitor people. It, it sounded fantastic, but it felt that I was in the big leagues. You know, this it was a great band. David was very unique. And uh, the thing that I always keep coming back to is like he was to all his fans around the world, where if there was one sentence I had to say about the guy, it's like if I was to do a tour and I was dedicating it to him, I'd call it the Be Who You Are tour. Because... It, that's what he stood for. So he allowed me to be myself. And whatever I heard in my head, and trust me, my head is full of a lot of music, I would just play it whenever I felt it in any song at any time. And he never disagreed. And he would always smile. And I played Changes different every night, Life on Mars different every night. And Woody and Trevor would look at me like, what, this guy's nuts. But Mick got it, Rano got it, and, and, and he was my ally because he, he's the one who actually auditioned me, you know. And, and he had taken some orchestration lessons with Tony Visconti, so he already was writing string arrangements and he was big talent and he would play very good piano and, of course, my favorite guitar player in rock. He's, he's an unsung hero. He, he even did the end of C. Emily play on pinups with me playing the piano, and he did some wild stuff behind me with strings. He was great on vocals too. He and David complimented each other so well. Some, uh, sometimes you couldn't tell who was singing. Um, the voices blended like no other. You know, maybe Simon and Garfunkel, you know, but th that's about it. I mean, the, they were just fantastic to watch and listen and I have to say it was a shame when that was over it, it, it needed to be over at a certain point because David had to stretch his wings but it was six months too soon for me for certainly for for Woody and, and Trevor and Rano but that's that's David's choice and he always stopped sooner than the fans wanted because he was a renaissance guy and a genius. So he would know more than us uh, the overall thing. That's where one of his areas of, uh, of brilliance, you know. You would have seen several times over the years working with David, he always moved on very quickly. 
Totally. Even on tours, when he was done with the tour, which sometimes was 10 or 15 or 20 gigs before we were done with the tour, it wasn't fun hanging out because he was done on to the next thing. Even Aladdin Saini was working on when we were touring with the other music, the Ziggy music. Speaking of that music that he was writing for Aladdin Sane, when did you first get to hear about it? When I walked into Trident's studio in 1973. It was uh, <laughs> on a need-to-know basis. He'd like just springing it on me. I, I actually did no recording in New York for the Aladdin Sane. I did it all at Trident on that fantastic Beckstein piano with the my favorite engineer of all his engineers was Ken Scott. And they had these uh, speakers that they play back on, and it's not like these days. Those days, they were gigantic speakers on the on the wall, and every night we blew them out. And the next day, there's a new set in, and of course, Tony DeFries and they were trying to make everything big and bigger than life and PR it in such a way as you know. So they had no problem just putting it on the bill for RCA and there was another set of speakers every night and talk about playing the music loud forget about it you know everything about that album happened very quickly how much time did you spend recording I know my takes on time and Lady Grinning Soul and Aladdin Save are pretty much first takes if you think about it even to this day it's out there for a rock album but more people it influenced a lot of people to feel safe to stretch it that they saw it was okay with David and I did it. But that particular version that you know was a first take. However, I played a blues solo first and David said that was too commonplace on Aladdin Saint. And then I played a Latin solo and David said that was too common. So he said, can you do something that you used... We would hang out so he would ask me about the jazz scene in New York because he was very curious and he was a sax player and we would talk about Charlie Mingus and different people and he said, can you play some of that avant-garde music like you told me you did? Uh, Because I used to jam with a piano player on one piano, four hands, and we'd be playing with our elbows and fists and all sorts of experimental stuff. (laughs) He said, can you play like that? And I said... That's exactly why I'm not working Saturday night, David. And he said, leave that to me. I know how to frame it. It worked. Your playing was so different to anything that the Spiders had heard before, especially on the title track. What did they make of it? It was, they were shocked. And fans, they became fans of me. It was really a validation. I wasn't doing it for the acknowledgement, but it was so off the wall, but I played it like a rock guitarist plays, you know, that no, you don't hold back. And I don't think I could conjure that kind of energy up now. I think you have to be 26 or 27 to do that. I could play it as fast and as clean, but I don't know that I could muster up that energy. I could for maybe another song with another intention because I still have the the music and energy in me, but that particular energy at that point in time... I think that's what's poured into that track. Because if you were to listen to the David Live album, there's a version of Aladdin saying that actually is even faster in more notes. And in 40 some odd years, no one has mentioned it to me. And the one that you're talking about from that title track, I get an email every day for the last 30 years from somewhere in the world. Every day, every day. Because David asked you to improvise, it must have been like performing live, but in a studio instead of a New York jazz club. Very much so, but this was in a studio, don't forget. So the audience in that case was Mick and David and Woody and Trevor and and Ken. And I played to them. And listen, you couldn't play a wrong note on that piano because the Beatles recorded on it, the Queen recorded on it. So, you know, it's like I was cheating. The notes, I just had to find them. They were in the air in that studio I just had to just listen and be there and let the music flow, and and it came out. I mean, most people only know me for that, and I've done thousands of tracks, many hundreds of albums, and all sorts of music. I've written over 6,000 classical pieces. Nobody knows anything except that solo, and 
that's enough for them. So God bless them, you know. So you never recreated the Aladdin Sane part the same way again? No, because the adrenaline was better in Trident. Uh, and I, I played well for the audience. They clapped. They loved it. It just wasn't magical. You know, there's when you're a good musician, you're always expected to sound professional. But there's 10% of the time you go into the zone. And when you're in that magical space, that's when music happens. But... I don't know any artist who it happens to 100% of the time. Many of the tours with David, he would come to me and he'd say, you know, we were good, but we weren't really into it. And then other times he'd say, that was it, Mike. So he liked sharing that with me. And we knew when we were phoning it in versus just in that moment, just killing it. As you said earlier, David gave you free reign to play what you felt. He never gave you specific instructions on what sort of feel he was after. No, he, he never said anything about anything. He directed that one because he was looking for that avant-garde sound, but he just said, what do you hear on this Lady Grinning Soul? What do you hear on time? And I just played what I thought was appropriate for the songs. I mean, anything I played was out of the realm of rock and roll. I don't remember... What was the most famous newspapers in 73 in England? Uh, there were the Times, the Sun, the Mirror, the Guardian. So I don't know if it was the Sun, but on a Sunday, I got the paper. It was either the Guardian or the Sun, and I got the paper, and on in the art section, right on the top, it said Mike Garson is the best rock pianist in the world because he doesn't play rock, David Bowie. That's what he, that was his quote. And he was right, you know, I didn't play rock. I still don't play rock. I mean, I I, I can imitate it, but it's not where I live. I'm an artist that is an improvising musician. That's really what I am. Because not many of the rock pianists at the time in the late 60s and early 70s had a jazz background like yourself. No, I loved what they did. And Billy Joel after and all that, I, and I still do. And and, and and even Keith, who was a fantastic piano player, uh, Keith Emerson, but none of them had that jazz training. They ha- they all had the classical training, but I had that too. But they I had studied jazz already with Lenny Tristano for three years, who played with Charlie Parker, who was a blind pianist. I had studied with Herbie Hancock. I had studied with Bill Evans. I had studied with Chick Corea. So I, I was bringing a whole... I was bringing the jazz and classical world to the best I could do to David's world. And and he was receptive. Trust me, no other singer would have been. <laughs> Mike Garson, recalling his introduction to the world of Ziggy Stardust. And in the next episode, Mike talks more about the Aladdin Sane album and the final days of the Ziggy tour. There are some great pieces of memorabilia from the Ziggy era on the Main Man Label website, along with a huge collection of other historic documents, including articles, telexes, letters and production notes, many of them never seen before, that we're adding to the Main Man Label website each week. It's a great record of a very exciting period in rock history. That's at mainmanlabel.com. And on the website, you can also check out the other episodes in the Main Man series. I'm Des Shaw. This is a Zinc Media MM Tech production. Thanks for listening.